Well, welcome everyone. We're so excited to see you. Thank you for joining us for another one of our amazing tastings here. It's so great to see all your faces once again. My name is Sarah Rathman. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at Dry Creek Vineyard. And let me tell you, this tasting, I know I say it every time that this is a tasting that we're excited about, but this one really is because, and I'll let Kim tell you the story, but this one really started it all for us. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that and I'll let Kim tell you. We're going to keep everybody on mute for, for the first, you know, majority of this, um, just in case there's any dogs barking in the background, people trying to vacuum. Um, we'd love to hear you guys through the chat functionality. So please make sure to use the chat functionality down below. We'll be monitoring that and answering questions. We also have the live transcript button on there. So if you need to see some computer generated subtitles, please hit that live transcript button if that's going to help you follow along at all. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to hand this over to Kim Stair Wallace, who's going to introduce our special guest, John Antonelli, for tonight. Ooh, hi, everybody. I see some familiar faces and a lot of new faces, and I'm super excited you're here. And um, I don't know about you, but I, it, my office smells so good. Um, and I am so excited to taste these cheeses and, and share a little bit about our wines and, of course, taste our wines. But I will give John Antonelli the credit for our, for our foray into virtual tasting land. And that is because, uh, what was it, a year and a half ago, John, back in, I think it was end of March or mid-March, I, or I don't remember, but it was, was it March? Mid-April. Mid -April. April. April of 2020, when, you know, the pandemic was just, you know, we were all in lockdown. Um, John's wife, Kendall, is the godchild of one of our wine club members. And um, this wine club member, her name is Meredith, reached out to me and said, you know, I really want to do a, a, a cheese tasting with my goddaughter and her husband who run this really cool cheese shop in Austin, Texas. And I want to do it for my family. And I said, okay. And then of course I said to Sarah, what's a virtual tasting? And we figured it out. And long story short, that was the beginning of our virtual tasting experiences. But most importantly, I had so much fun with John. I loved the cheeses that they selected. And I just felt there was like a little bit of a kindred spirit between John and his wife and, and me and, and, and our winery. So I'm really happy to have John here. Awesome. I'm so thrilled to be with you tonight. This is so cool. Uh, so many smiling faces on camera tonight. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. This is going to be such a, a, a great opportunity to eat cheese, drink wine, and just be together. And, um, and Kim, I thank you for having me. Just absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have roughly 55 households or something like that joining us. But first of all, permission granted to pick up your glass and start swirling and tasting. So Hopefully you have our Fumé Blanc poured into your first glass and feel free to start sipping. Um, what, what I guess what I'll do, just a little brief background on the winery, because I know there are quite a few people on this call who um, are new to Dry Creek, and maybe I should tell you a little bit about our family, and then we're going to learn all about John and cheese and all of that, right? And taste some wine and cheese together. Is that the plan? Sounds awesome. Okay. So first of all, Dry Creek Vineyard is, um, well, is what's that? Well, I thought I heard somebody. Um, we are a family owned winery in the heart of Dry Creek Valley in Sonoma County, California. And I'm the second generation. We will be turning 50 next year, having our 50th anniversary. And folks, I can't believe it. I literally grew up in this business. I worked here all through my childhood and my teenage years on the bottling line and in the office and then in the tasting room and came back to work for the winery in the mid in my mid 20s and have been here ever since took over as president about 10 years ago and um, I will give a great deal of credit to my father Dave Stair who's the founder of the winery for not only founding Dry Creek Vineyard but frankly um, helping to put the California wine industry on the map and so our brief history for my dad is my parents were originally from Boston. Dad got bitten by the wine bug in the 60s and decided to move the kids, you know, the whole family. They, they sold everything they owned and loaded us in the car and we drove across the US and dad went back to school, um, graduate school to study winemaking at the University of California at Davis. And eventually uh, in the early, it was actually 1971, 
they came upon a very sleepy neglected area called the Dry Creek Valley and bought a 55 acre prune orchard. And this was the location where he wanted to build his dream winery. And I love this picture because uh, of course it shows the original construction of the main cellar, which is where we still make wine and we still conduct tastings and the groundbreaking ceremony where I was turning over the first shovel full of dirt. So you see, I guess it shows, you know, just how long we've, we've been here. And what I also love about it, is if you look in the background of that picture, you actually can see those old prune orchards in existence. And then behind those are, we're looking sort of due east towards Napa Valley and, and Mount St. Helena. Anyway, one of the varietals that my father pioneered is Sauvignon Blanc, and he truly put that wine on the map. He was the first to plant Sauvignon Blanc in our region and the first to release a wine called Fumé Blanc. And of course, that should be the wine in your glass uh, and remains one of the flagships of the winery. And this past harvest was actually the 50th harvest for the winery. And we had a little celebration on the crush pad and my father, who's now 82 years old, came and we opened a bottle of 1980, excuse me, 1972 Fumé Blanc, that's a picture of him, dumping it into the uh, crusher sort of to bless this vintage. And it was so much fun. We all got to taste a little sip of it. And you know, I gotta be honest, for a 50 year old Sauvignon Blanc, it was shockingly good. Now, I wouldn't say I would wanna drink it every day, but it had from some varietal character. It's, you know, you really could still sense that it was Sauvignon Blanc. It had a lot of acidity and it was, it was pretty remarkable wine. So um, anyway, all these years later, we're still alive and well and um, making the best wines of our lives and, and really having a lot of fun doing it. That's amazing. I love that picture of you breaking, uh, breaking the dirt. Yep. Yeah, backbreaking work, as we say, right? <laughs> and if we're lucky, we'll taste that soil in the wine tonight, which Correct. is awesome, right? Absolutely. Same soil uh, that creates these amazing grapes. And, um, Absolutely. And, and part of the journey tonight, um, as, as Kim and I spoke this week, kind of getting our uh, game plan in order, we talked about how the unique nature of tasting and tasting cheeses and wines and how things flavors can adapt and how they can be very personal to one another. And so we're going to go in deep on that along the way. Um, I do recommend opening the chat window if you have a chance. Um, I, I somehow love typing and talking at the same time. And, and so I will uh, potentially be responding to questions as they come along. Uh, so feel free to do that uh, if you have a question throughout the course of the tasting. Uh, definitely put your screen in gallery view. Um, if you uh, have the ability, um, in the top right corner of the screen, there's a button that says view. And if you, if you pop that into gallery view, part of the, the joy of these moments is community building. And we learned that back in that very first event with uh, Meredy that Kim was alluding to. Um, and that was that, you know, we had been doing virtual tastings locally for hundreds of people, but that was the first time somebody asked us to ship a cheese class in a box and um, we struggled and we pushed and over the course of the last 18 months we did that event and it was so amazing um, because up until then all the language was at, around socially distancing and um, and having moments of community were pretty rare and I we loved it so much um, Kendall and I have been blessed that over the last 12, uh, 18 months, we've hosted over 17,000 people in these virtual settings, um, sharing uh, our love of cheese, spreading joy and, and aiming to live our mission, do good, eat good. And tonight's really special because we're gonna get to kind of deep dive into uh, some really amazing cheeses along with these really amazing wines. Um, and Kim is going to be your wine expert for the night. Um, she lives, breathes it. Uh, and is an expert in the field. As you see, that was a, is a, in her blood from an early age. Well, not the alcohol, probably wasn't in your blood at an early <laughs> age, but, but wine and winemaking um, and the culture around it. And I'll be your certified cheese professional for the night. I know um, everybody's always wanted to have a cheesemonger friend, right? Raise your, yeah. raise your hands if you've always wanted to have a friend that's a cheesemonger. And that well, is John. And I will be that friend for you. John, you got to tell people though how you got in the cheese business. Sure. I, I think that's super interesting, and and you know what you guys are doing 
And I'm not, wait, before you do that, I'm just going to brag a little, okay? I'm going to tell a little story. I, I, I know you probably don't want me to, but I'm going to tell you a little, tell these folks a little story. So the other night I was watching the um, football game. I forget which one. And I'm cooking at my stove and I'm flipping my, you know, whatever I was sauteing. And all of a sudden on national television, I hear an advertisement and I hear, hi, I'm John Antonelli. Hi, I'm Kendall. And we own Antonelli's Cheese Shop. Well, guess what, folks? They've been selected by Capital One in a national television advertising campaign. And I was so excited. And I know, John, you know, we talked about it earlier this week, like how cool it is to be a small business owner and, you know, have that kind of um, attention placed on your on your shop and what you guys are doing in the world of cheese. But if anybody is a watching, it seems to be on football mostly. Anybody? It's, um, it's uh, we've been very blessed. They've been playing it on uh so many channels really you just yeah. have to not fast forward through commercials uh, well it's a charming commercial so now that i've mentioned you. it you'll all see it yeah you can see my better half now instead of watching the shows you can just watch for the commercials like we're <laughs> doing and uh it's it'll come on at some point i'm sure during uh truckers from hell or one of those types of uh, <laughs> uh shows but yeah we've been blessed as a small business there's been ups and downs but um while I'm going through a little bit of my background, um, as we introduce ourselves, one of the things that we've done, we've been hosting classes um, in person since February, uh, September of 2010. And one of the things that we've done ever since the beginning, the very first class of six that we taught on September 12th was an icebreaker. Um, we, are, we are essentially now family. Um, I mean, Kim and I have been family since that last day. It's how it works. We're sharing food. We're breaking bread together tonight. And so the, the icebreaker has always been, if you were a cheese, what would you be? And some of our team members uh, talk about it as a soul cheese, um, like you might have a soul animal or a soul partner, um, or Kendall says like a desert island cheese. Um, now you don't have to commit for, to this one for the rest of your life. It could just be for the next five minutes. So. Um, and of course, you have a cheat sheet should you need any guidance. But throw your soul cheese into to, into the chat window. I'd love to get to know y'all a little bit uh, closer. Um, so uh, uh, Stephanie has. Do you mind, uh, Stephanie? Do you mind if I share your question um, out loud to the? Uh, you you sent me a direct message, and I just want to honor whether you're okay with me sharing it out loud or not. Um, uh, so. My name is John and uh, my wife and I uh, opened Antonelli's Cheese Shop in February of 2010. Uh, it was on our honeymoon that I turned to her to say I was gonna quit my job. I'm a CPA by trade. Um, so a certified public accountant and audit uh, and wasn't quite enjoying the experience as much as some other folks were. And so I, um, I told her we, I was gonna quit and she said, okay, what are you gonna do? And I said, something in cheese. And so. It started this journey uh, to find my passion and cheese really found me, artisanal cheese. And, um, and, it, and because I was pretty much talking about cheese in my sleep, I was eating it for every meal, uh, Kendall ultimately fell in love uh, with it in the, in the same way. And so we opened the shop. We've had some great years. We've had some rough years as all small businesses do, um, but we're in a really great spot. We have a, a team of 38 people. Uh, we have a retail shop. We do wholesale um, to Whole Foods, Central Market, 150 restaurants in the area. Um, and uh, we do events all across the globe now. Um, we can ship up to 45 countries, which is pretty cool. And so, um, and so my soul cheese for the night, uh, Kim, you're going to have to present yours too, or your soul wine if you'd like. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. Um, would be a mozzarella. Um, this, uh, mozzarella is a uh, pasta filata cheese. It's a stretched curd cheese. So they kind of make the curds and then pull them apart to make that really beautiful ball. And this week as a small business owner, uh, we're about to launch a brand new website on Monday. Uh, my kids were home sick for a day. I feel like I've been stretched in a lot of directions, but at the end of the day, it came back together in that perfect little ball that people will still like me. Um, so that's mine. Um, I see some Humboldt Fog winners some Stilton, uh, some truffle cheeses, Gouda, Sarah and Bill, Reblochon, all the way, great little French cheese. Mm. Um, Kim, how about you? 
Well, I love any kind of blue cheese. I, I, I absolutely love, you know, a creamy blue, a Roquefort is always lovely. I'm excited about tasting yours. Um, you know, um, oh gosh, what's the other one I love? Um, oh, I just drew a blank. It's the one with the ash in the middle. I just drew a blank. Brain freeze. Um, hum, uh, Humboldt fog. I'll think of it in a minute. I'll think of it in a minute. All right, minute. perfect. So thank you for playing that little game. Um, as we start to explore the rest of our journey, you'll have uh, your four cheeses. Um, you may have plated them already. Definitely show us what your plate looks well, I gotta, like. I got to do a little bragging here. Okay, folks, check this cheese plate out. First of all, true confessions, I didn't put it together. And a lot of you who've been to the winery, you know we have an amazing hospitality team. So they put it together. And I'm telling you, it looks like Martha Stewart arrived and I'm feeling pretty fancy right here because my cheese is beautifully arranged. John showed me his cheese platter a little while ago and it was cheese. <laughs> cheese and pairings. This, yep, is, cheese and pairings. this is, I, uh, I have uh, at least one of these events a day, if not two. And so I, I, I get the right amount of cheese for the right oh, that's of chance. Oh, that's pretty, Leo. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Mike and Michelle, thanks for sharing. You all had some really beautiful plates um, and they'll be empty by the time we finish here tonight, uh, if all goes according to plan. Um, and so the, uh, the, I I'm excited to get some food in your belly. Yeah. Uh, so the next, the next thing that I typically do uh, and that I want to share with you all is uh, sort of getting our palates back on par. So I don't know about y'all. Some of you may have had a whole gallon of coffee this morning or had hot sauce at lunch or maybe ate something um, really bitter for dinner. I, I have no idea. Uh, but oftentimes throughout the course of our day, our palate goes through pretty significant changes and adjustments. And so what I like to do is bring us back all together with just a mini tasting experience. So hopefully you received a little mini toast crackers, something mm -hmm. crunchy uh, in your package. And what I want you to do, just break off a little corner of one. You don't even need that much and just kind of get a little bit of one. And then go ahead and, and pinch your nose, throw the mini toast in, it's, well, keep your nose pinched. Me talking that way doesn't sound that great. So start chewing on it and pay attention to what's happening on your tongue. You might pick up some salt, you might pick up some umami. And when you're like, oh man, I know exactly what this thing tastes like, release your nose and exhale out through the back of your nostrils. Those of you that held on longer will get a more profound hit on the olfactory. And all of a sudden you get this really intense sort of toasted baguette experience um, and really uh, big, bold uh, flavor. And so what we like to say here is, um, uh, our taste on our tongue plus the aroma in our nose equals flavor. Mm -hmm. And so through the course of the tasting tonight, pay attention to what's happening because the way wine and, and cheese interact, we'll have a, uh, sometimes they'll play really nicely. Sometimes they'll counter each other and it's all based off of our own unique palate. So um, your tongue picks up salt, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Um, and those flavor profiles are uh, we have different sensitivities on our own palate. So like my mother can't have salt really because it's overwhelming to her palate. My mother-in-law can't have enough salt to actually taste the flavor. So there's a sensitivity difference too. And then on top of that, our old factories have experienced a lifetime of moments um, that have been registered by the brain. And so our, our flavor memories are really particular to who we are. So while I may suggest some flavor compounds or notes that you might pick up, in truth, each one of you is gonna taste something different, which is why we have the chat window because it's really fun for people to be like, this one tastes like Reese's peanut butter cups or this one tastes like um, uh, Frito pie or whatever the flavor components might be that create that moment for you. And hopefully you'll have plenty of them. So, um, uh, and then as we go through the tasting, Kim and I will talk about how the wine and the cheese interact with each other and what you might expect. Um, one, one of the things with cheese that I find is that, um, and I'll walk you through what to look for and how to taste it, um, is that with a, with a really good wine, and Kim can kind of explain this a little bit better, you spend a lot of time assessing the, the structure of it, looking at the colors, 
you know, aerating it, the strapaggio method, doing a number of different things. And then you see a piece of cheese on a cheese plate at a party and you just throw it back, throw the toothpick out and walk away. Um, I want you to do that same sort of approach with the cheese tonight. Um, take your time, enjoy it, um, break it down with your teeth, let your saliva work it a little bit, let the wine acids break down some of the proteins and you'll be surprised what happens. I promise you, um, even though some of these cheeses are stinky, they are amazing. And so um, uh, this is a full contact tasting tonight and uh, you'll be in for a real good treat. I love that, full contact. <laughs> yeah, you wanna add anything else? No, you're doing great. I mean, I think uh, it goes without saying that, you know, make sure you've given your, you know, take your wine, your, your fumé blanc and really give it a nice swirl. Hopefully it's not served too cold. You want it nice and chilled, but you don't want it freezing cold. If it seems like it's really cold because it was in the ice box, you can put it in your hands and, you know, warm it up a little. Um, make sure you're, you know, don't be afraid to stick your big old schnoz deep in that glass. Ooh. That's how you're going to really get the nice, beautiful aromas. And, and with this Fumé Blanc, it, this is a very aromatic Sauvignon Blanc. It's a very, it's a Sauvignon Blanc with very minimal winemaking intervention. So it truly expresses the nature of the grape, which is that bright citrus, um, you know, lemon peel, lemongrass, that sort of slightly herbaceous, grassy, um, a little bit of a pungency, a nice bit of uh, uh, lime leaf, very refreshing. It's um, bone dry, so it should be so quite tart and crisp on the palate. Um, no, you know, no oak aging, so there's no sort of heaviness or creaminess or that kind of texture. It's more of that lively, refreshing texture that should pair really well. In fact, I know it will because you're an expert, so I am super I like my stomach is starting to growl to be well honest. let's let's yeah yeah I get that let's eat it's part of uh my strategy is if I hold everybody off just the right amount your excitement level goes through the roof with the first bite of cheese so it's like it's all about that building anticipation don't want to go too far though so let's this cheese though I don't want you to taste just yet I'm going to talk about it for a second okay. um, and then I'll I'll, I'll kind of give you a, 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 give you the gr green uh, green light in just a second but our first cheese that we're gonna taste is mini Harbison. This definitely has an odor to it. Um, this comes from our, uh, the soft ripened um, uh, bloomy rind category. It's really our second category of cheeses uh, when we talk about our styles. The first being fresh, which would be like a mozzarella. Um, but what makes this style really significantly important is the use of mold. So on the outside of the cheese, you can see this, there's uh, this really bright white, this is a uh, uh, penicillium camemberti. So it derives from the mold that's used to create camembert in Normandy and France. It's a very prolific mold that's been harvested and used throughout the generations throughout the world. Mm. Um, and uh, that mold breaks down the protein in the cheese curds after setting the wheel. And that activity, breaking down proteins into peptides and then into amino acids creates different types of aromas and complex um, uh, organics, um, molecules. Um, and the other thing that's super cool about Harbison, which I'm gonna, I'll go into a little bit more, and a reason why I don't want you to eat it, the outside layer around the edge, that's bark. So definitely don't take a bite of that. Um, I've done it before, you're welcome to, it's edible, but it is bark. And it As in tree bark? It sure is. This is a really special cheese. Um, this is Harbison. This comes from Jasper Hill Farm in uh, Greensboro, Vermont. So in the Northern Kingdom, our friends, um, Matteo and Andy Keeler, they um, lived in Boston, but they grew up spending summers in this little tiny town of Greensboro, uh, Vermont. And when they were in out of college, they wanted to do something in agriculture. And they really wanted to go back to the land that they spent time on. Greensboro had been uh, in disarray and, and, um, for a long time. And so they went back and they figured out that they could do um, cow's milk dairy. And then they started making cheese. This is one of their newer creations over the last decade. Um, but this cheese, Harbison, you've got the mini version. The eight ounce version um, won best in the country um, uh, about six years ago, um, and it's continued to win awards. Um, it's a style of cheese that's uh, um, made after, molded after uh, Vacherin Mondeur, which is 
uh, probably the world's sexiest cheese in, um, in from France. It's illegal in the United States because it's made with raw milk aged less than 60 days. But they kind of modeled it after that. And the reason why they wrap it in bark is because the cheese center gets so liquidy that the bark is what holds the wheel together. Without that, it would just turn into a puddle on the shelf and break apart. Um, so the classic way of eating a cheese like this, we never ship it really because um, it's for special events like this. So this is probably the first time we've used it in an event is that you take the wheel and you actually take a knife in along the crown of the, the cheese and you cut the top off oh. and the, in, the inside is spoonable. So the inside becomes like a personal fondue. Uh, you just dunk bread right into it. Uh, you dunk crackers. Kendall and I dunk other cheeses or we make a steak and we dunk that right into it. I mean, anything is possible. Um, but this gives off, this style of cheese gives off a serious aroma, uh, funky um, mold, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, very vegetal, asparagus. Uh, it's a super intense cheese. And But if you eat the inside, the cream part, that's gonna be where you get the lightest flavor profiles. If you eat the rind, the rind is gonna taste more like mold. And then if you eat the bark, the, it's gonna taste like bark. So if, if you wanna start with just the inside, definitely do the inside, then try the, uh, the rind um, a little bit. Always try the rind. Every single bit of cheese that we can sell is edible. Um, so if you like it, keep eating it. And okay, so want, we can taste uh, it then. I can taste it. Go ahead, it. taste the inside, yeah. Uh, this is a cheese worth um, a million bites. I love this. Uh, when it's uh, when it won Best of Show at the American Cheese Society, uh, I was running the competition at the time. We only had two wheels that were entered, and it won Best in the Country at, for the Cheese Festival. There was only two cases left in the country, and they drove them all the way from Vermont into Madison, Wisconsin, so that a couple hundred people could try wow. a, a nibble. And... Uh, Okay, I have two questions. Well, first of all, I've already learned, and I'm sure a bunch of people did too, that we cut our this cheese into a wedge because that's what we thought was the right way to do it. But next, so you're saying cut it in half, like the top half is off. Yeah, basically you take the, the top off, okay. flip it over to the side. Yeah, I'm gonna actually do that. And when I lean over here, it's because I, I can't, I'm just gonna do that. So then should we be tasting this cheese alone or with the little toast? Try it, try it naked first. Uh, definitely always try it naked and, and always try the wine by itself. Try when you're doing tastings, try the product by itself. Yeast is a very bold flavor. And so if you have the, if you have bread and cheese together, you'll likely end up with a big finish of yeast mm. um, first. Okay. So I already know what happened in my mouth and I don't want to say anything because I want to know what happened. In the, like I just had a, uh, I just had a lightning bolt happen in my mouth. That's I'm not awesome. going to tell you what happened because I want to know if other people had so, the same experience. Yeah. So this is like super amazing. I'm Stephanie, that is great news that it is delicious. Like huge thumbs up. I will tell you y'all, cause we're all spread out around the country. Um, Quinta is a cheese that's made in Point Reyes station that is made in a similar way. Any, uh, there's a cheese made in Maryland called uh, Merry Goat Round. And then seasonally, if you can find Rush Creek Reserve, it comes out last week through the end of the year. They're all bark wrapped cheeses and they all experience the same way. So did you taste cool. it with the Fumé Blanc? Because that's the lightning bolt that I'm talking about. What happened when I had a sip of the wine? Tell us, tell us. Well, okay, so for me, okay, so the, the, the cheese is, is kind of salty, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like salty and all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, that's salty. Then you taste a, a sip of the Fumé Blanc and it made the wine turn sweet and unctuous and almost, um, I mean, not like really sweet, but it's like it brought out all the fruit flavors in the wine. That's awesome. And, and, and yeah. I think enhanced the fruitiness of the wine. Did that, did it, does that ring true for anybody? Anybody else? Yeah, Wait, I, see, yeah, I see yeah, a couple Catherine, of them. We got a couple of people. So one of the one of the flavor profiles that's pretty consistent in this cheese is and, and when I say these two things together, you're going to be weirded out. But then make sure you're breathing out as you're tasting. But oftentimes, uh, raspberry and French's mustard. Those two things when 
if you combine those two things, which nobody has ever done, but the molecules of the aromas that a cheese, this, this particular cheese gives up are most reminiscent of the, if you add those two things separately. Okay, um, I just realized why I normally do these tastings in the cellar. Because here I am, I got my computer in front of me, my mouse pad, and I just spilled the cheese all over my mouth. <laughs> my mouse pad. This is why Kim cannot be allowed to eat in her office. So <laughs> if you take our Turkish apricots that you got, so Kim just talked about how, you know, salt can really, depending on the level of salt, really balance bitterness. Uh, a bitter note, it can also... Uh, offset some uh, sour uh, tartness, mm. um, creating those sweet notes. So that would this that pairing would be more of a contrast than complementary, which I think is amazing. And now if you take uh, some of your apricot, you know, small amount, apply, this is, you know, that pure sweetness, high sugar, uh, give that a bite in the same setting. Uh, these, we, we uh, these are amazing, super fresh. So the cheese- Super the fresh dried apricots, if that's a thing. There are really like leathery apricots and then there's really moist apricot. These ones are really beautiful. So take a bite with the cheese, the apricot, and, and then have the wine. And one of the things that I'll note about the experience that you had possibly, Kim, because um, we're all experiencing it differently, is when you have a really, uh, uh, decadent cheese like this, um, the butter fat coats the palate. And if you take the bite of cheese first, what it can do is actually take away some of the power of the taste buds, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So the wine doesn't have enough effort, uh, uh, access to impact maybe the sides of your tongue or the very back, depending on where you were chewing the cheese, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't typically chew food at the front of our mouth on our, on our sweet, roughly the, the science is where the typical sweet uh, taste buds live. So those kinds of things can be really fun to play with. And, and what's really fun about this cheese, some of you mentioned Humboldt Fog. I know somebody's having a brie right now because UPS did not get the cheese in time. Um, that style of cheese ripens from the outside in. Oh. And so on a Humboldt Fog or a Mount Tam or some of the other more uh, classic styles, you'll actually see three layers, right? The very inside remains chalky, like a fresh cheese. Then you get the creaminess around the outside and then you have the rind. So all three of those layers play a different role in flavor. Brie and Harbison, however, the goal is to just have that cream line through and through, it's, tastes like butter. It's really, really good. Like I, I, would, I don't have a sophisticated enough knowledge of cheese and wine pairing to probably have ever picked something so strongly flavored. Be, you know, I, we would normally, I would probably pick, um, oh, like a goat cheese, like a chev or something, or even like a, I don't know, creamy ricotta or a chef, you know, something much more mild. Um, and I just, I like, I, and, and of course the Fumé Blanc is very bright in acidity, right? And it's a sharp, it's a sharp wine. So the fact that it kind of trans, it totally transformed the wine. It's almost like it doesn't even taste like the same wine. It's really interesting to me. That's cool. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Goat cheese would have been the classic play. I know my team really wanted to do something special. Well, I like that we did product. something totally different. I, does anybody else? Is that like, I'm sure a lot of people can relate that this is just sort of thumbs a up on. The, yeah. Thumbs up on the pairing. Yeah. All right, yeah. I'm looking for happy dances. Carolyn, that was pretty close. That was all, yeah, there it is. I, uh, I love seeing all of your faces. Um, you know, we don't get to interact as much as I'd like to. Um, I know. In this current moment, but you guys are giving amazing energy to Kim and I right now, so. It's uh, really okay. good. I know we have others to go on to. I hate to move on, but I think we should. Uh, I'm here, I'm here all night. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I'm here until the internet goes out like it did yesterday. Um, so the second cheese that we have is actually one of the cheeses that got me into cheese for the very first time. So um, my team knows that this is special to me, so I'm grateful that they put it on there. Now, this is Oso Irati. Um, this is a, a semi-soft cheese uh, from the Pyrenees Mountains um, on the French side. And so, uh, where the Pyrenees Mountains are the border between Spain and France. 
And this comes from really the Basque country, uh, from the, um, the Valley of Oso and the forest of Irati. Um, uh, these are a name controlled cheese. So much like um, Champagne is name controlled and has to be made in the Champenois method with certain grapes and et cetera, et cetera. This cheese is one of the many that are name controlled um, in France and um, other European countries have different designations, but um, this is a sheep's milk cheese. So of the milk types, we get cow's milk being the most versatile, goat's milk being the most acidic, um, sheep's milk being the most luscious and fatty, and water buffalo milk being the most rare of the four, but incredible wet hay notes and um, intensity. Um, and so uh, when a cheesemaker is approaching cheeses, because I kind of skipped over, I'll kind of give you a little bit more um, because I like y'all so much of the styles. We, you know, fresh cheeses are made to be eaten quickly and they have no rind. They're just one, one way to capture the proteins and the fats into a source of pro, uh, food for a couple days later. Soft ripened cheese is the category that we just talked about. Those are made to age 30 to 60 to 75 days. So you think about that in terms of historical contexts. Uh, uh, typically it was um, part of the daily chores to make, take leftover milk and turn it into a, a, a form of sustenance that could last for a period of time. And so being able to keep milk from spoiling for 60 to 75 days, that was revolutionary. Um, and then we have, and that was typically women in farmhouses raising families with one animal um, who, who kind of created that style of cheeses. And then we have wash dried cheeses, which would be our third category of cheeses. And, and those are um, the stinkiest. Uh, so I got to tell you about them so that you can avoid them if you want or go after them like I do all the time. Um, but wash dried cheeses are bacteria driven. So the rind is developed, is, you, uh, is created by developing an environment for a particular bacteria to live. And the two things that that bacteria does is create an orange, almost sunset hue on the outside of the cheese or, and rather, uh, an incredibly intense smell like a uh, gym locker room or sweaty gym socks or feet, whatever it is that really excites you to eat a bite of that cheese. Um, and uh, it's a cheese monger's favorite category. Well, when you, when you work your way through cheese and you finally get to wash rides, uh, they're life-changing um, and, and pretty amazing. Um, wow. uh, Carl Polovec is one that you have on your plate uh, tonight. Car uh, Carl didn't get the UPS package. So I wanna also talk about what he got. So Polovec is a wash rind from the Normandy area, same area where camembert comes from, area <laughs> driven and super delicious. And will also go really well with the Chardonnay. And, um, and that's, uh, that will be our second wine of the night. Um, and that's because Polovec was classically made in an area that had a lot of apple growth. Um, so there was a lot of apple brandies that were made, and sometimes Chardonnay can give an impression of that flavor profile. So sometimes, not all the time. Um, uh, so uh, uh, so Oso, how, coming back I, to Oso. I got a quick question. So this is how we sliced ours. How would you? Oh yeah, that was, that's totally, yeah. Okay. Now we're, that, there's a very, just that last cheese was really the only like, unique way to cut a okay. cheese yeah, gotcha. um, for a party. Um, and again, it's not wrong that we cut it. I cut it into a wedge too. It's um, more convenient that way. Uh, so Osirati is uh, historically significant because um, these little tiny farms all across the Pyrenees basically collect their milk, small herds of 10 to 30 sheep, collect their milk, bring it into the co-op of Onatik, and then they make this cheese. It's very, uh, friendly to the palate. It's got a natural rind on the outside. So if you smell it, it I, like the way I describe a rind like this is it, it, it looks like dirt, it smells like dirt. It's probably gonna taste a little bit like dirt, but it's ambient molds that exist in the caves that this cheese is aged in. And oftentimes these rinds are the best pairing with alcoholic beverages 
because they're wild and they're fun. And so don't forget to try pairing the rind of this cheese. Uh, so take a bite. It's pretty spectacular. Um, uh, and I'm going to chew while, Kim, you want to talk about the next beverage? Oh, you just took oh, a bite. Oh, I just want to eat. Yeah, I, I've got a couple of members of my team on this call and I feel very guilty because they are not eating these cheeses. And oh. when I look away from the screen, it's not because I'm not paying attention. It's because my cheese is all over here and I have to reach for it. Oh my gosh. It's so rich and creamy. Yeah. And so I mentioned, so this was one of the very first cheeses I found after that honeymoon decision. So when I quit, it was really about like American cheese and like uh, laughing cow and grilled right. cheese sandwiches. Then I found this and I found out how good it is, right? This is an amazing cheese. And I knew it was going to be one of the two. Once we decided to open a shop, this was going to be in the shop. This and Comte were the two cheeses I knew from the beginning. Mm. And so we, uh, before, while you're finishing chewing, we paired it with uh, Genoa salami. So this is made by Oliveria at Ali. Um, his family has been producing salamis in Rome for over a hundred years, um, but he is one of the younger members of the family. He wanted to kind of break out on his own. So moved to the U.S., started in Virginia, now operates out of California um, and produces world-class salamis. And this is Genoa and uh, Genoa salami is really focused on quality of the pork. That's what they're just, they're just trying to showcase good pork. And so it's very simple. Um, it's got that meatiness that you like. It's got good texture on the tongue. And it really plays well and elevates the sheep milk of this cheese. How, I haven't tried the, the salami yet, but um, with respect to the wine, so would you have the cheese and the salami and then the wine? Would you have the wine and then the cheese? Or, I mean, how do you recommend doing that? That's a great question. Um, over the year, well, I'm a, I'm, I come cheese first to, because of my upbringing. Yeah, I come yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally a preference thing. And okay. it's interesting to do it both directions because again, uh, you might have two very different experiences depending on how the, the cheese coats your palate. And right. so I would definitely try the wine by itself, get really excited about it, pay attention to what you're experiencing then try cheese first and wine and then go the other way and just have fun with it, right? I don't find, Kendall and I don't uh, really believe in like rules of eating because okay. like at the end of the day, I, I actually learn a lot from my kids because for the last seven years, they didn't use silverware. It, and so, uh, you know, it's a healthy reminder that texture is an important part of the experience just as much as what happens once it's in your mouth. So true. When my children, when Taylor and Spencer were little, I used to love to have them smell wine at the dinner table and they would come up with the most amazing descriptors that I never even thought of. And, you know, it would be like so spot on because, you know, they're just as fabulous. Well, speaking of the wine, so this is our 2020 Estate Block 10 Chardonnay. And this is kind of a special wine and it's sort of a, it's, it's sort of symbolic too of the transformation of the winery from my dad and his, you know, when he ran it in his generation to my husband and I, um, this is a wine that comes from an estate vineyard in the Russian river Valley. Um, we actually have made Chardonnay every vintage, you know, since 1972. And we used to make a fair amount of the Sonoma County appellated Chardonnay. And it was quite nice. We had vineyards and Chardonnay vineyards planted here in Drake Beach Valley. We had a Chardonnay vineyard in Alexander Valley. But the reality was that it, it, it wasn't really great. And part of the reason why it wasn't really great is we didn't have it growing in the right location. And after many decades, we all, we understood that Chardonnay really excels in a cooler climate region. So we actually planted a vineyard. Uh, uh, it's about 20 minutes south of here in the Russian River area. Um, we actually used, we call it Foggy Oaks Vineyard, but we now call it DCV 10. And we just name our vineyards one through, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So hence Estate Block 10. But nonetheless, the, the, the um, appeal of this vineyard site was the fog. And so this area that's not too far away from here is significantly cooler than Dry Creek Valley. And even though the Dry Creek Valley is very much um, influenced by the Pacific Ocean, and we have that fog layer that rolls in here as well, it's definitely you know, quite a bit cooler in Russian River. So this vineyard that we, we um, uh, developed allowed us to really bring a, a kind of a new level of quality and, and heightened 
um, uh, expression to our Chardonnay. And now today we make a very small amount of a very, very nice Chardonnay. And I will give a great deal of credit to my winemaker, Tim Bell. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when we hired Tim, <clears throat> sorry, it's been about, I think 10 or 11 years. Sorry, hold on, let me just cough. I'm gonna mute and cough. Sorry, went down the right, wrong, wrong pipe. Um, we, we were really in a quandary about the future of our Chardonnay program. And I was, look folks, I was raised on Sauvignon Blanc. We make a whole line of different Sauvignon Blancs and Chardonnay, you know, I love Chardonnay, but I just don't drink it a lot. And, and I kind of said to Tim, you know, I'm thinking about getting out of the Chardonnay business. Not sure we should even make Chardonnay, but you're a new winemaker. Let's see what you got. You know, I'll give you one chance at it. And he went to work on um, his version of our Chardonnay and ended up basically selecting a very small section of the vineyard, about 30 vine rows in the northeastern corner, which he felt was a better suited area, even within this district in Russian River Valley. So a little better draining soil, a little cooler climate, et cetera. And he came, you know, he, he, he employed some winemaking techniques that we hadn't been doing before. One of them is called a cereal fermentation where it's partial wild yeast fermentation. And then he inoculates with some various different yeast strains. Um, it does undergo a, por a portion of it is barrel fermented. So the fermentation actually takes place in small French oak barrels. And then a part of it goes through what we call a malolactic fermentation or ML. Uh, and malolactic fermentation is what converts the very crisp malic acid to that kind of creamy, softer approach. Um, and, and so the, a combination of these things really kind of brought this wine to a whole new level. And I'll tell you what, I love our Chardonnay and we make, a, as I said, a very small amount of it. Um, what I think it shows is just how beautifully balanced this Chardonnay and Chardonnay can be. It's not a, while it's been aged in fr French oak barrels and it under, has undergone both the barrel fermentation and malolactic that I mentioned, it is not an oaky wine. It's got beautiful acidity. There's some lovely crisp apple, tart apple. I get a little bit of a tropical fruit sort of um, aromatic on the a nose and, and maybe a little bit of a, a, a very, very subtle toasted hazelnut characteristic. Um, and and, and I, I think it's a really lovely wine. We were actually really excited. Tim and I just tasted this last week with a group here at the winery and I hadn't tasted it since we bottled it. <clears throat> and we both looked at each other and we're like, Damn, this is really good. So for, for to pair Chardonnay though with, you know, this cheese and the salami, I probably wouldn't have done that. So I'm always interested, like, how did you figure that out? Well, I, th I think with, uh, when I, when we approach a Chardonnay. Are you trying um, to do like creamy? Cause this cheese is kind of creamy in texture and, and yeah, yeah. a and, mild and, creamy texture. And certain wheels. Buttery, have a little buttery. Um, certain wheels have to, uh, like some tropical fruit notes in it. And so you can go, the, the thing that I like the best about this cheese is that it is so versatile. And so it goes, it goes with, it's one of uh, the few cheeses that I can confidently say goes really well with white, mm. red, beer, rosé. Like it's very versatile because it's, it's a friendly cheese. It's got soil characteristics to, from that rind. Mm -hmm. uh, some earthiness and that often brings out um fun flavors from the grapes um you know trying to connect down to the the root structure of the vines and so um so when we were playing with it and then that meat again isn't like a, part of the special nature of genoa is that its aim is to be delicate its aim is to have that essence of pork but not to be a really intense spiced flavor um, and so I think what you get is a really um, beautiful like uh, mouth feel from mm -hmm. the cheese and the meat together uh, and then the wine really comes together and it and it makes it an even like creamier velvety yeah. chardonnay experience which I think everybody loves. I, I actually think it's really really beautiful together um, I, I don't know what other people think maybe they can just put their comments in the chat um, yeah, they, they know I'm going to ask about happy dances at some point, so we'll find yes. out. Right? Yeah, no, it's really delicious. Um, That's awesome. Nice. Well, 
keep drinking that. Why don't we, we'll move on to cheese number three. I'm happy to answer lots of other questions I, along the way. Um, I have another quick question, probably really dumb, but you know what, if I have it, maybe someone else has it. And it's about the salami. So with Genoa, how is it that they can call salami Genoa when it's not in Genoa? Um, it's a great question. Um, oftentimes, uh, name controlling didn't start early enough for styles. And so uh, there, are, there are protected designations, but they're often based off very particular wording. And so just the Genoa salami um, is, is very, it's likely too generic mm. for, uh, the, uh, for a name control. Interesting, because so, that, that's yeah. what, yeah, you know, it's just fascinating, huh? Yes, and like wine can, got the, the name controls can get down to like the vineyards and stuff, but the name controls of some cheeses and meats are, are much harder to control because the supply comes from lots of different places and it moves. Mm. And, and so there's uh, you know, uh, a lot of different examples of meats and cheeses that just can't be like feta. Like at this point, feta is too difficult to name control uh, because it's too prevalent. Um, and so Genoa is likely the same. Is there a region of feta? Is, where, is there a town or a region of feta somewhere? Uh, Greece. Would Greece. Be. Okay, Greece, yeah. So Greece uh, should have owned the name control. But they should have. They should have. They should have followed the, the, the path of the French, huh? Yeah, well, that's the, they, it just all happened so late. And, and part of the reason that PDOs exist in the cheese world is because of a cheesemaker in Minnesota. I, I like that last comment. The the uh, how yeah. do you say, oh so irati blew someone's mind. <laughs> yeah, the way that we remember this cheese uh, for your future is, and this is how Kendall tells the story, but uh, it's oh so irati. Oh so, so good. A, you never forget that cheese now. Um, and I can imagine that area, the Pyrenees, right, the Basque region, very mountainous, very steep, and I've never been there, but I've been to areas of Switzerland where they make um, sheep cheese out of sheep. And it's so rugged and, you know, these slopes are like this and these sheep are sort of clinging to the edges. And I don't know if it's as, as like that or if it's more on valleys, but it's, it's got to be pretty intense. Right? It's actually the, uh, the Pyrenees, I got to take my kids to Onatik uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, it's more rolling hills mm. uh, and valleys okay. Uh, okay. Coming, down, yeah. coming down out of the Pyrenees and into the valleys and uh, the rivers. It's pretty amazing. It's stunning. Um, oh. And um when you're driving in that part of the world, it does have a very cool Basque name. Um, and so uh, you'll, you'll see signs for it all over the place. Oserati. Interesting. On every, uh, every I know there's, there are a lot of people here who like to travel. We need to put yeah. that on our bucket list. Call me up, let me know. So we're moving to Holland right. now. So that was a semi-soft cheese, which is your best melting cheese. Uh, good for mac and cheese, grilled cheese. This next style is firm, so they've, Basically, same process. They've just figured out a way to reduce the moisture content even further. Uh, moisture, in this case, is the enemy of aging. So if you have too much moisture, eventually the cheese will spoil. The least amount of moisture, the better for the long run. And so this is Brabander Gouda. Um, drum, uh, uh, it is one of the finest Goudas on the planet. I learned today from one of my team members that Gouda is the about 50% of the world's cheese consumption is Gouda. Um, and so this, this hails from Holland. Um, it's a style of cheese making that it doesn't result in a sweeter cheese, but it results in a perception of sweeter sweetness. And so Gouda is really popular. Um, and this is a goat's milk Gouda. So we've had a cow, we've had a sheep. Now we're getting to try go uh, goat's milk. If you looked closely at the two cheeses, Oso Arati and Broadband Gouda side by side, uh, I kind of destroyed my piece of Oso already. You can see the Oso is ivory in color. Right. And, and the goat milk's cheese is white. Uh, goat milk can digest beta, goats can digest beta carotene. So the, that yellowing doesn't make it into the milk. And so when you're looking at aged cheeses on a shelf, if it's bright white, it's either insanely pasteurized or uh, low quality milk or likely a goat's milk cheese. Okay, did everybody hear that? That's like one of those, that's like a pro tip right there. We So if it's yeah. too white, 
Say it again. It's well, if, if it's bright white, it's likely goat's milk, aged goat's milk. Okay. And then cheap is ivory and cow is usually yellow. Um, and so Betty Coster is like the Julia Childs of the cheese world. Um, and she owns a, a cheese shop in Holland. And one of the things she does is she partners with uh, uh, cheese makers to create a recipe for her, her business. Um, and this is one of them. And she ages them at a higher temperature. So the development of proteolysis happens much faster. Okay, uh, hooey, uh, wait, hooey, hooey, what is? Hooey, what is? Betty Coster, No, 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 proteolysis, what's that? Prote proteolysis, the breakdown of the proteins. Okay. Yeah, I was talking fast, wasn't I? My certified cheese professional test really came out of nowhere there. Um, but yeah, so the breakdown of the proteins again, uh, is where flavor develops in cheese, except for the blue cheeses where that's fat. And so the longer a cheese ages, the more amino acids can develop over time. And this particular cheese ends up with a very like butterscotch caramel hint of acidity with that perceived sweetness. It is so cool because if you remember earlier, I said goat's milk typically tend to be the tangiest. When you have this Gouda, aged Gouda, you get, you're not getting the tang, you're getting more of, the, of a, a burnt caramel type flavor profile. And so- Speak, speak to us about the texture, because I'm sure everybody's noticing there's a little bit of those um, magical, yeah. magical chunk, cr crunchy, crunchy crystals in there. Holy goat, yeah, that's right. That's the, these are tyrosine crystals, so- Not to be confused with pyrazine, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Tears in, in really a, a, a herbaceous wines. <laughs> um, so it's, I call them flavor crystals. Um, they, as in aged cheeses, this can develop. It's, mm -hmm. it's a protein combined with calcium phosphate. Um, so good. Again, this is a home run cheese. Uh, on Tuesday, Brabender Reserve comes out. It's a seasonal cheese. We get about uh, 40 wheels. Um, we're one of the biggest uh, buyers of the cheese. It's, she ages the wheels an extra eight months. And so it turns into cheese candy. So keep an eye out in your local shops for Brabander Reserve, um, formerly known as Black Betty. It is a special treat between November 15th and December 31st. Mm. I keep thinking that the, each one just keeps getting better and better. Great. That is really, really good. And we, I, I, we paired it with a fig and black tea jam from uh, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, from our friends, Matt and Claire. So definitely dunk it in there and eat and then drink mm -hmm. that Zinfandel. Well, so just a little background on the Zin. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so busy eating. I can, I, 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 gosh, I gotta stop. I gotta clear my throat or I'm gonna choke. So the Zinfandel, is a variety that was first planted here in Dry Creek Valley by the Italians back in the late 1800s. And when my family arrived here, um, after prohibition or, you know, basically during prohibition and after everything that was planted as Zinfandel was converted to prune orchards. And remember, I told you my dad bought an old prune orchard. But luckily for us, there were still some existing Zinfandel vineyards producing on the hillsides. And and most of the Zinfandel vineyards that were planted here were planted by families that, you know, it was for kind of their own home consumption. And we are lucky to still have very few, but a few old vine Zinfandel vineyards. Well, this wine really pays homage to those heritage or legacy vines in that we um, developed a special, a very special propagation technique where we took budwood, so those are canes, off the oldest vineyard in the area, a very famous vineyard planted way before the 1900s. And we grafted that onto rootstock that was planted in a new vineyard. And, and the vineyard happened to be in front of my house. So when Don, my husband Don and I bought our house, we um, wanted to, to develop this vineyard with this propagation technique and we did it. And so we called the vine Heritage Vines Infidel. So this is a photograph for an illustration of how you basically take the little budwood from the original you know, I'll call it the, the, the heirloom vine, the old hundred plus year old vine, and you make a little slit in your rootstock, stick the bud in, wrap it up, and voila, you know, you've basically grafted your, your grape vines, and that's how we graft over vines all the time, but nobody had done that with Zinfandel, and nobody had done that trying to 
capture the essence of an old vine Zinfandel in a new Zinfandel planting. So our winery was quite innovative at the time. And um, it's one of, this is one of my favorite Zinfandels. It happens to be 77% um, Zinfandel and then about 20% Petit Syrah and actually one percent, actually 22% Petit Syrah and then 1% Old Vine Carignan. And the idea is we're trying to, again, replicate what we call field blends because the Italians that settled here actually planted these Zinfandel vineyards with a hodgepodge of varietals, not just Zinfandel, and they're referred to as field blends. So this is a, a wine that I think kind of pays homage to uh, the Italian heritage in this region and in America. And, and, I'm, and, and the other thing that's super really special about Zinfandel is it's not grown anywhere else in the world. It really is America's heritage grape. And it can be made in many different styles. Um, it's one of the most difficult wines that we produce. Zinfandel is a very uneven ripening grape cluster. So during harvest, there'll be um, green clusters in there, there'll be purple clusters, and it takes a long time to figure out when to make your picking decisions. And it really takes kind of an expert, I think. And this is why you find many very overripe, high alcohol Zinfandels on the market. Ours is the opposite of that. There's some beautiful acidity, some brightness. You have some lovely raspberry, boysenberry, um, maybe a little bit of blackberry fruit tones. Um, you also have some nice spiciness. Zinfandel is naturally a very spicy variety, so it can have spices uh, almost, if you think of, um, well, we have Thanksgiving coming up. So if you think of some of the spices we use to make uh, pumpkin pie, right? Allspice, nutmeg, and then spices like cinnamon and cardamom. Those are very traditionally you know, good descriptors for the spices in Zinfandel. Sometimes Zinfandel can be very black peppery or white pepper. This is a little, I think, more white pepper, um, but you definitely get some of those beautiful spices, spicy notes, but with balanced alcohol. So my, our, our philosophy at our winery is all about balance and elegance. And our wines are intended to be food pairing wines. And in this case, cheese pairing wines. I'll just say one last thing. I, I noticed a, a, a Unlike you, I can't read and talk and type. So, but I did see a question about barrels. And so I want to just address that. So, so we, we grow the Zinfandel here in Drake Creek Valley. We pick it at the right temperature. And um, we actually uh, do something very interesting with our aging process within the barrels. We designed specific barrels that are called fusion barrels that combine a series of different or a number of different species of oak. So they're French oak heads, the heads are the top and the bottom. And then the staves are a combination of Yugoslavian, Hungarian, and there's actually a little bit of American oak. So a multitude of oak species and each oak type gives a different you know, flavor and, and, and aromatic profile. And, and my winemaker, Tim, worked diligently to design just the certain type of barrel just for this one wine because we didn't want to mask those beautiful, delicate fruit aromas. And it would be so easy to kind of, you know, overpower that, that I mean, I'm getting for me anyway, really lovely blackberry, a little bit of raspberry um, fruit tones. And, and I, you know, there's a, you don't want to cover that up. And so with the wrong type of barrels, you could really mask the, the delicacy of the fruit aromas. That's awesome. And, and part of the reason for pairing Brabant and Ragouda with the Zin was the idea behind that uh, warm spice uh, pie, right? Like Brabant and Ragouda tastes like you're eating dessert in many ways. And, and, and those fruit flavors and that, uh, those warm spices, I think, go really great. And then if you, if you throw in the fig, that black fruit will ideally push out more of the fruit. You're looking for that, that, that contrasting. Um, so, um, and we do have another question from Sarah and Bill, but why don't we, we'll do the last, I'll start talking about the last cheese. Sarah, Bill, we'll come back to that. I think it's a great question. I'd love to know the answer. Um, oh, Sarah answered uh, in, uh, in the chat. Go Sarah. Go All Sarah. Right, see? Great. Um, and so anyway, that's an awesome pairing. I think it's, again, hopefully there's some more happy dances out there for that one. Um, so, woo, yeah, jazz hands. Love it, Mike and Michelle. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, 
the last we're moving now on to our last cheese the the sixth category of cheese before blue would be our hard cheeses so uh, again like uh carl you have parmigiano reggiano most of us have parmigiano reggiano probably in our fridge right now that's a classic hard cheese it cracks it crumbles um it is very dry um and the fat protein salt, everything is much more intense per bite um Usually folks use them for grating cheeses. I love to have hard cheeses on a cheese board because I think they create, again, a really fun texture. When you bite into them, they create really fun sound in your ear. So there's really a great reason to have them on your table. Um, but now we move into a blue cheese category. Um, uh, best Zinfandel Charlotte's ever had. I know, that just made my day, Charlotte. Woo, go Charlotte. Um, I, uh, so. The way blue cheeses are made, uh, it's super cool. These are now back to mold. So these last three categories, the flavor really develops not because of the mold on the rind, but because of the process the cheese makers use and the age, uh, the length of time it takes to break down a cheese. Um, <clears throat> like for instance, a manchego can be aged for three months and be semi-soft, six months and be firm, or 12 months and be hard. Same cheese, different age, different texture. Um, and texture plays a really important role in flavor. Um, and the, the last category is blue. So what happens is a cheesemaker um, gets their vat of milk, they add penicillium Roque 40 or one of the other few strains of blue cheese into the, into the liquid milk. So they add a liquid mold into the mold, into the milk, then make the cheese wheels, the curds, put them together. And after a couple of days, they take these long spikes, these needles, and they puncture the wheel of cheese. Um, and what happens is um, this mold is aerobic, so it needs oxygen to grow. And so the, these striations in the curd, uh, in the wheels, allow air to get into the inside of the cheese. Now, a cheese maker could certainly choose not to pierce the wheel at all and just allow the blue to uh, mold the outside of the cheese, which is common uh, in a handful of cheeses. Uh, or uh, they pierce it very few times, it'll be a very delicate cheese, or pierce it a lot. So the blue cheese category is vast and huge. You've got crumbly and dry, creamy and rich, uh, lots of blue, little blue, no blue. It's, it's amazing. Um, some of you may have a piece that actually show that like, you can see the line straight down of blue mold on the cheese. Mine doesn't have that, so I can't show an example, but you may see that. Keep an eye out for it because it's cool when you finally get to see it. Uh, so blue cheese is coming all sorts of different flavors. If you don't like blue cheese, I encourage you to try lots of them because there's so, uh, uh, such a wide variety that eventually you'll find one that you love and you'll be grateful that you did. So this comes from Hook's Cheese Company in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin makes a whole lot of cheese um, and uh, Tony, um, uh, Hook has been making this cheese with his family since the 70s. Uh, and they started by making, you know, classic Havarti, Colby, traditional block cheddars. Um, but then they moved into blues and they had a lot of fun with it and they've won tons of awards for it. So this is you calf to be kidding me. Uh, what a play on words, what a pun. Um, cow, goat, and sheep milk all mixed together. So mixed. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, this is as close to winemaking in some cases that we get. It's a, a blended <laughs> milk. And you're adding a certain percentage of, of cow versus goat versus sheep in order to kind of pronounce, get the pronouncements that you want from the different elements of the milk. Uh, it's lightly uh, pierced, so you're not gonna get, it's very cool on the palate. I don't think of this cheese as very astringent or intense. And so hopefully you really love it. Mm. I'm seeing some really nice comments on the Zin pairing. I would agree. Yeah. So Cabernet, so let's talk about Cabernet. Mm. Well, um, so we produce exclusively Dry Creek Valley Cabernet. And we tend to grow our Cabernet on the Eastern and Western benchlands and hillsides of the Valley. And they're very distinctive, different growing regions. Um, on the Western side of the Valley, you can see it's quite steep, very mountainous, our vineyards are you know, well above, oh, 1,200, 11, 1,200, 1,300 feet and higher. And the other thing that's unique about that Western area is the soil content. We use, or we don't use, 
Mother Nature provided us with a lot of iron in our soil. So they're, they're very you know, steep, fairly rugged vineyards planted in areas where there's high iron content in the soil. And so with the, the, the importance of that, or I guess the impact of that is we tend to get a lot of cherry cherry fruit tones, you know, bright kind of cherry, grandma's cherry pie fruit. Um, the, the, at, at my winery at Dry Creek Vineyard, here's a good picture because this is all hand-picked. There's, you know, it, you can't run it. It's very hard to get, you know, any kind of mechanization up there. And you can see that soil is pretty red and it's just different here. We don't have that soil profile um, on the west, or excuse me, the eastern bench or say in you know, Eastern like Napa Valley or even like Alexander Valley. It's very exclusive to the Dry Creek Valley. So this particular bottle, the 2018 Cabernet combines both the Eastern bench and the Western slopes. It also is a blend of all five Bordeaux varietals. So we are very much classic, you know, my father who was the original winemaker and today with our current winemaking um, team, we really, really are classic in our approach. So that means we, we use all five Bordeaux varietals. What are those? Cabernet, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. It's exactly how they've done it in Bordeaux for centuries. Um, and what we're really trying to do is create a, something that's much greater and much more complex than a single variety. And it also allows us to sort of um, uh, pivot, if you will, when mother nature gives us an extremely tannic Cabernet year and the Cabernet is just like super tannic, we'll add a little bit more Merlot, right? To soften it, make it a little more elegant. Or maybe the, maybe the color is, is a little bit um, challenged uh, in a cool year, for example. Sometimes color isn't quite as, you know, as, as dense as you'd want. And we'll add a little more Petit Verdot, which is very dark and inky. And, and so it's very, oh, I'm loving this. It's so nice to hear that. Um, but so, so that's why we do the, the, that's the whole purpose of the art of blending. Now that's, you know, you'll, you, you talk to a hundred different wineries, everybody has a different philosophy, but that's been our philosophy for 50 years. And, and um, you know, it seems to be working. And so this is a wine that's very multidimensional. I would call this, um, there's a savoriness to the aromatics. So this is another distinctive characteristic of Dry Creek Valley. When I say savory, you're going to get a little bit of maybe a dusty, mushroom, mushroomy, earthy kind of forest floor. You know, it, you've got that Cabernet fruit, you know, the, the, the cherry, and then you've got some of those kind of earthy characteristics. Um, and sometimes even a little bit of dried, um, oh, dried spices, things like uh, sage and maybe a little bit of, um, oh my gosh, what's the spice? Uh, thyme and some of those kind of spices. And then we also get a little bit of leather, a little bit of espresso, a little bit of kind of you know dark cocoa powder, but multidimensional. And, and what happens when you really take time to analyze this wine and swirl it and and you know let it open up in the glass is it's going to change. That's what you want. You want the wine to just draw you in. You don't want it to be like a one trick pony. And so um, I really love Cabernet from. I love our Cabernet. I love Cabernet from Dry Creek Valley. Obviously, we are um, you know passionate about this region. And I think it's very distinctive and different than other parts of the world. And I've, I've had the, you know, the, the experience over the years of getting to taste Cabernet in lots of different parts of the world. In fact, I've done it in Bordeaux with a couple of folks on this, 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 uh, this tasting this evening. Hi guys. And uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's just really fun. We also, um, we also do age this wine in, in about mm, just maybe under, uh, just under two years in small French oak barrels. And you know, really, the intention is that those those wines, or excuse me, those varietals will meld and marry together and be really beautifully balanced. Um, I haven't tasted it yet with the, with the blue cheese, but one of the thoughts I had is because this this is a softer cabernet, so we make a, a variety of cabernets, and some are very intense and much more tannic and and that sort of thing. This is a I would call you know medium body, softer, good structure, good tannins but um, maybe a little softer than another one. And I, don't, I was curious what you guys thought with the pairing with the blue cheese, because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's challenging to pair red wines with blue cheese, right? And that's why a lot of times blue cheese is paired with um, you know, a dessert wine or a sauterne or something else. And I'm just curious how, like you're the cheese expert, John, how do you feel these two go together? So the, the way that we, you know, this is, um... As far as pairings go, this 
is probably the most more intimidating, most intimidating type of pairing to do. Okay, so I'm not alone when I just said oh. that. No, no, no. It is. It's very intimidating. Um, and um, part of that I'm tasting it. is that uh, red wine has many different qualities um, that can impact the flavor, the tasting experience that you're having. Um, and sometimes cheese can go counter to those. So, you know, my wife always likes to say, again, there aren't rules, but if you have a really beautiful aged um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, like you've been sitting on it for 20 years, it's a wedding anniversary type thing. And people come into the shop and they're like, hey, what cheese should we pair with it? We will often say, you should drink it on its own. Like it's in and of itself, it is the perfect experience. So you might, you could have cheese on the side, but don't go looking for a perfect pairing because you're likely gonna uh, find um, that the wine itself should be enjoyed as it is enjoyed. Now, it's a, I said it's an intimidating pairing uh, opportunity, but it's not an impossible one. And so typically, what we see with red wines and blue cheeses, both of them have really long finishes. Mm -hmm. um, and certain uh, styles of red wine have a uh, bigger structure, um, more tannin, um, bolder body. You know, they, they, they stand up and have a louder roar, right? And, um, and so what we were doing with a pairing like this, the, you have to be kidding me, is much... Uh, there's two really types of blue cheese. Uh, there's those that cool your palate and those that spice your palate. And so by choosing one that cools your palate, you're offsetting some possibilities of the tannins or the astringency that sometimes can come with a, a really big red wine um, and allowing then the aromas of the mold and the cream to play with the berries. And so that would be what we're aiming for in a pairing like this. Now, as, as I mentioned um, earlier with cheese um, or implied, but I didn't talk about is that every single wheel of cheese is different. So even right. though Tony made this batch and there's 15 wheels of you have to be kidding me in this batch, every single one of them will taste slightly different depending on if they aged on the top shelf of the rack or the bottom shelf if they were, if one had more direct air flowing from a fan or something, they all, that all impacts it. And so, um, so even if, um, even if I'm tasting an amazing pairing, some of you might be tasting a different wheel of this you have to be kidding me. It's only a few pounds. So we definitely went through multiple wheels. Um, so you might be having a different experience. Anyway, that's why I, um, I think it would be a home run, but we'll have to just find out from y'all. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like it. I, I think I, I, I heard, saw a couple of comments there that somebody's got the Endeavor. Endeavor, John, is our single vineyard Cabernet that's, you know, got a little more tannin. It's a big wine. Our Iron Slopes Cabernet. I feel like something with a little more tannin would, would I probably would have picked. But listen, this is what we're all learning. And I, I, I'm a neophyte. I mean, I love cheese. I've been eating cheese my whole life, but I am absolutely no expert in cheese. So I love to try and taste. And I feel like the Zinfandel, actually, I feel like the Zinfandel and then the other, and, and the Fume and the Chardonnay were better paired with those cheeses. Yeah. I want to enjoy this cheese alone and I want to drink this Cabernet alone, but I don't know if I, you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Which is, yeah. This, is this is why we're all doing this together. Would it, uh, is that, does, is that ringing true for anybody? I see Carl, I see, I see Carl, is it Garrity's? I see you, you guys waving, but my gosh, the wine, the, yeah. excuse me, the cheese is great. And the other thing I love about this cheese is the creamy texture. I'm not a big fan of those dry, crumbly, really, I, they just seem to be very harsh and they lack sort of finesse. Some of those, those, those dry style, um, uh, Roqueforts or blue cheese. Yeah. I like, I like the creaminess. There's a velvetiness to it. It's fun and it's fun. And I think, Kim, it, I think what you hit on was that you're by eating, you're enjoying the cheese and you're enjoying the wine. They're within the same experience, right? But they're maybe not in the same mouthful. Yeah, I don't, then, I wouldn't put them in my mouth together. 
And that's, that is also a great way to enjoy the food, right? That's classically how we eat. It's, um, yeah. and so, so it's also a good thing. Um, but you should try, if you have any of the Harbison left, try yeah. some of the Harbison with this wine. Oh, and the again, Harbison. Okay, that yeah. first cheese. Okay, that's a good the idea. First and, and again, because it takes a bold cheese to stand up to a big wine. Okay, that's, I like that idea. And so, uh, and I would pair, if you have a bit of the salami, at the, the salami, the Harbison, and this wine will potentially be the best pairing on the plate. Not that we put it in those orders, but those three things together could possibly be the best pairing of, of all. So you guys all hear that? That's play with. That's why I like to play with my food, and you know, like part of okay, this. So is the, that I just had the umami thing just happen. Like I just had that magical moment. That is so much better. Those three. Those okay. oh, those three. Totally. And um, you know that was oh. so interesting. And what, I forgot to mention, we didn't even try the chocolate either. Oh so my like, gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I got so excited. Um, uh, but we, now that you did the Harbison and you should do that because that's. Yeah, everybody do that. Take your first cheese, that really gooey Harbison that we tasted with the Fumé Blanc and try it with the Cabernet. So amazing. Um, hello, Rich. Uh, Kendall is not nearby, but um, I, I wish she was. If she is. I, you know, I now I, you were on, you were on screen number two of my Zoom. So now I can pan over and see you. It's great to see you. Yeah, everybody needs to raise a toast to Rich because Rich, it was Rich's wife that originally set up the tasting a year and a half ago. One with of the greatest Tom human me. beings I've ever met. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers to Meredith. Mm. Oh boy, that is really amazing. Well, the Har the Harbison and the, and the cab. Yeah, so now cleanse your palate because we're going to try something else. Um, I forgot to talk about the chocolate. I ate my piece without <laughs> talking about it. It happens. Um, but um, the uh, chocolate is uh, from Tian. It's Tian Gang. It's made by Maru. Uh, it's a chocolatier in Vietnam. We were the very first company to import it into the U.S. Um, it is a single origin, uh, single varietal chocolate which means that really these, these folks are really just trying to get the best beans they can from specific growers in, the, in different parts of Vietnam and turning them into delicious flavors. You want to eat a chocolate like this just as you were drinking that wine. It's got as many nuances as these cheeses. It has a, a start, a middle, it has a finish, goes on, let it melt on your palate. It is amazing. Uh, Maru has won so many great awards. Um, and the, um, uh, when you think about dark chocolate, especially something at 70%, your brain probably tells you bitter, but this chocolate does not really present that way. And so now following on what Kim said, the cheese and the wine together don't elevate each other, but now try it with this, this little hint of bitterness, a uh, bit of sugar now, which is going to alter uh, the way your palate experiences the rest of the flavors of the cheese and wine and see what happens. So the creamy cheese, that beautiful rich chocolate, chew those together, follow with that glass of wine. It's, you know, we just had dinner with Harbison and, and Genoa. Now we're going into the dessert course and you're just sticking with the Cabernet. That's so pretty big. Shot. I can't believe an hour and a half has flown by you guys. My goodness. I, I, I'm a, I'm a happy camper. Oh my gosh, it is an hour and a half. I'm sorry. I know, it's an hour and a half. I can't believe it. That was so wow. cool. If there's any other questions, definitely put them in the chat for us, but we'll try to uh, wrap up here soon. If anybody has to jump off, I just want to let you know that we're going to take a little bit of a break for the holidays, and then we'll come back at you with the fun new virtual tasting calendar for next year. So if you have any thoughts, please contact me. You can find me on the website, um, just Sarah R at drycreekfinner.com. I'll put it in the chat too, because we'd love to give you what you want. So if you're right. looking for something, if you've enjoyed something over these past two years, let us know so we can make sure to have it for you next year. So uh, I think we'll, we'll probably hang out for a few more minutes if there's more questions. Otherwise have a phenomenal night, everyone. I have one sort of really basic question for you, John. So, you know, okay, you go into the, well, Unfortunately, we do not have a beautiful cheese shop in the town of Healdsburg where our winery is. 
We did, but it's no longer in business. But we do have a really nice grocery store that has a very nice cheese shop. And but anyway, you go in the in the store, you know, and you want to do a nice charcuterie board for the holidays or just for whatever, just for you know, uh, uh, whatever Thursday night. And there's all these different cheeses. And let's say you have, you know, if you were trying to put together your uh, 101, like cheese 101, if you were going to get three cheeses or maybe it's four cheeses, what are the three or four that people should, you know, because part of putting together a really nice cheese selection is picking what's nice about these, like what you picked for tonight is they're so radically different, just like the wines are. And that's what makes it exciting. And I've gone in and bought cheese and I buy too many that are the same, sure. right? So the, the simple approach that we take uh, and we let our, our team members choose events plates and we just have a fairly standard expectation that when you go to select products, you wanna choose uh, different milk types. If, okay. we, if you have three cheeses, you want three different milk types. If you have six cheeses, you want a mix of those. Um, you wanna choose different, uh, like one cheese from different styles. You don't wanna typically overlap on styles because what'll happen then is you'll get your texture uh, variety. Uh, if so, if you just, all you do is those two things, different milk types, uh, choose different styles from the seven styles, you'll end up with a really solid cheese plate. Um, that that will go well with a lot of different wines and like uh and so that's my best advice and then if you really want to get fancy don't overlap country of origin unless it's the usa because our cheese makers are amazing and mm. our country is so big that it's as if it's a different country when you choose uh, uh don't over like we don't overlap states or countries that's kind of our philosophy mm. uh, okay and, so and, don't have two wisconsin cheeses or two Ita uh, french cheeses or yeah, yeah. Because yeah. typically you're going to find similar flavor profiles from the milk, from the diff the same area. So, uh, so that's kind of uh, that's our strategy. And you can always call your local cheesemonger if you have them and ask the question. You can always call our shop. I was going to say they, everybody can call you, right? You yeah, well, they can, yeah. If you're standing in front of a cheese case and you're stumped, you just gonna... call our team and be like, "Hey, I'm looking at these four things. What do you think?" We'll see. They might know what they are. They might not. But definitely look out for your. Uh, your local cheesemonger. Well, I was going to say, and you probably have some special cheese uh, uh, boxes to, for the holidays for people. Sure, yeah, now, yeah. Was, now's the time was, we should be ordering cheese. I was emailing with Doris. Yeah. And uh, so we do uh, also uh, gifts. Oh, somebody's knocking on the door. Uh, gifts, uh, events that we ship across the country, um, all sorts of good stuff. So visit our new website on Monday, Tuesday, when it finally comes out. It's going to be awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. Well, John, I can't yeah. think of um, Looks like somebody wants your number. Well, I'm not going to get involved in that. <laughs> Cheese shop numbers, they're the best. People at the counter are always the best to answer the questions. That's so great. Well, yeah. unless there are any other burning questions, I am just so grateful everybody joined us this evening. I hope you learned a little bit. I know every time we do this, I learn a lot. I, lo I, I love these pairings. I'm not Sarah, by the way, I'm not leaving the office till they're done. So don't plan to go home till I'm done eating cheese. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, it was awesome. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. And, um, thank you, everybody. I, and thank you, Kim, for having me and for letting me spread joy through cheese. And, and one of my favorite things, if you don't mind, Kim, at the end of a tasting is to take everybody off mute so I can say thank you to them for coming. Absolutely. You guys Absolutely. keep us in business. I absolutely and I just remembered the cheese that I would be Telegio. Yes, so good. Sarah, can you take Thank everyone you. off mute? Yeah, I'm gonna take everybody off mute now. Oh, or I'll ask you to all unmute. Yay. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, John. 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 Thank you,